So as she said, I'm Mackenzie Sorensen, and I'm discussing vessels of the past, uh, intangible maritime archaeology in Oceania. This is my first year's PhD student, so this was mostly going to be an introduction into my project itself and sort of helpful insights into where it'll be going. It's also an extension into my master's thesis where I uh, looked at the British Museum's oceanic performance artifacts and how well they were doing without access to be performed. Um, it's also a passion project because uh, my grandma was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and at the time I just really fell into this obsession with memory and ethnomusicology studies to sort of combat Alzheimer's disease. So you are going to hear and see representations of indigenous heritage in the following slides. I acknowledge the Hawaiian, Atori, and Rapa Nui Island nations of which their land was forcefully taken and never legally ceded. I'd like to give my thanks to Oceania's remarkable efforts to share and preserve their heritage under immense pressures and all images and recordings that you're going to see are publicly available through their express consent. Um, I didn't have time to do a lot of music and videos, but just email me or ask me at the end and I'm happy to play a lot of the links that I included that I won't have time for today. I'm also just happy to talk about anything, music or performances, so you can contact me at any time. So we'll start with my research objectives. Yes. Um, my four main themes of my research are gonna be performances as, art as artifacts themselves, performance as identity and performances used in memory and also as heritage building. Cultural memory and performances offer an interesting case study into intergenerational qualities of intangible heritage and the importance of preserving intangible artifacts within the archeological record. The gap in this research and literature is mainly that archeological re recordings and research and handbooks leave out Oceania or minimally cover intangible artifacts of performance. Um, some artifacts are a continuation from prehistoric cultural complex, some are using past coding patterns and materials from hundreds and hundreds of years ago, so it really is a rich area to excavate. The traditions are at times purely utilitarian and used as a tool like navigational oral traditions or social bonding purposes like warrior dances, spiritual respect, and sometimes it's just for pure entertainment. So most of the authors are across the field agree that the field is definitely over theorized right now. Um, I'm gonna be using sensory archeology, span maritime archeology span and ethnomusicology. And now everyone agrees that the shift really needs to get to be using practical research and methodology so we can start to fine tune our theories. So leads me to my methods. I'm gonna be attempting experimental archeology span and ethnographic hybrid model. Um, I'll be doing participant observation and experimental performances. This will mean that my project will also be written and performed, either hopefully in a dance and a, a song or one of the other. Um, I'm inspired and I'm researching right now digital means of doing this. I'm inspired by the VR technology and people have been making video game reconstructions of endangered material knowledge. I'm also inspired by the American Anthropology Association. They've created a touring theater for African doula knowledge. And here in the UK, the National Trust partnered with the Maori and they've repatriated and reconnected kept heritage in the UK through performances. So there's lots of interesting things going on. Um, a brief introduction to Oceania. I've included in this map, um, I didn't have time to go into the specifics of each dance and region but definitely talk to me after and I'm happy to go into them. So I've just sort of included so you could see the differences um, and the nuances between them. So Oceania is commonly referred to the geographic locations of Australasia, Micronesia, Macronesia, and Polynesia. It can also refer to the prehistoric Australasian migration complex. Archaeologists link settlements into the Neolithic, particularly into Australia, and economically it is more complicated with the majority of the islands owned by Western nations. The map displayed now is from the 1990s ecological definition of the region based on a tropical spectrum. As you can note, there are color specific zones, but the boundaries are often fluid with many archipelagos and island nations sharing cultural and geographical bounds. For example, Kiribati is featured here as Polynesian, but some islands associate with Polynesia while other islands are strictly Micronesian. Additionally, the southern tip of the Polynesian Triangle is Rapa Nui, which is owned by Chile, so culturally Polynesian but geographically South American. 
the Lapita Cultural Complex is the foundation for studying origins and thus tracking the evolution of performances through oceanic history. The Lapita are the ancient people that can trace their common ancestry through almost all the island groups. Evidence from archaeological excavations date the Lapita to the Neolithic, and they are the catalyst for the Austronesian expansion in the region. The archaeologists conclude that there are performances in the Lapita cultural complex and lifestyle, and they mostly know this through iconography of pottery, the shared navigational knowledge that has continued, and shell trading. For example, in the Kula Ring trade loop, there's a variety of um, shell artifacts that come in types of like pendants, rings, and armbands. And due to the persistence of Lapita and tangible heritage and the reemergence through contemporary cultural traditions, you can infer that this formed shared cultural technology formed memories and it's through this intangible heritage that we can trace performance. Um, Zabo stated that connections and the idea of community were not or at least not regularly reinforced through physical contact and good exchange. Rather, remembered connections were materialized through the maintenance of ancestral heirloom objects. In this sense, curated shell valuables act as materialized memory or as mnemonics. So this generational wealth can be gifted through a tangible heirloom and also intangible memory form. There hasn't been a lot of maritime archaeology done in this region besides warships. Um, so all of the reconstructions that you see are done through oral traditions and pottery iconography. So Lapita cultural discoveries have really catapulted oceanic cultural memory and pride, and it's resulted in cultural festivals, revival of oral traditions, and the sharing of variety of art. The importance is not just to the archaeological record, but to the oceanic people. As the famous Epi Halo says, the ancestors have not only sung, but danced the world into existence. Oceania is therefore the sea of islands, a combined connected force, and the Lapita are their common link and their common ancestors to their sense of place. So wayfinding is um, important to know here. Wayfinding is um, a performed seascape or landscape, and it has an it allows the individual to orientate themselves, leaving mnemonics either tangible or intangible. And then you can map out these orientations through, pop, through paths that are performed and shared. Most of the iconic and culturally significant wayfinding efforts have been the Hokulea voyage. Hokulea means star of gladness, and this voyage was reconstructed through oral traditions um, and craftsmanship through the Polynesian Voyaging Society. It completed the Polynesian Triangle of Hawaii, Atori, and Rapa Nui. And this had connected the people who had been separated for centuries. Interestingly, um, the voyage was singing the line, it is located above, it juts out on the horizon, a contour stands out permanently in the midst of the rising sun, just as they saw Rapa Nui on the horizon, which is just as promised to them in the navigational song. The impact of this was revolutionary and catapulted Polynesians people into a cultural renaissance. Contrastingly, the photo on the left is the Micronesian wayfinding tradition, and it is considered by almost all academics and oceanic people that it's an immediate need of safeguarding. And I really hope to see it have its emergence just as Polynesians did. So with Western models, we are entirely missing intangible artifacts like performances, songs, memories, and inside the archeological record. The first step to documenting and engaging with this heritage is to begin to decolonize this record and the academic model. Oceanic people increasingly ask for their culture to be studied in their own terms, and there's a wave of interest for their endangered material knowledge to be documented, revived, and preserved. Colonialism is foundation on, foundational on emotional control and emotional erasure. By continuing to leave out emotion out of heritage, we are just maintaining the colonial systems. Equally, we're allowing uh, marginalized communities to have all the emotional labor. We are just enforcing colonialism. So therefore, archaeology needs to embrace emotional heritage and intangible values. Um, where at present, intangible heritage is kind of seen as like a second best. Like, okay, we don't have the artifacts, so at least we can get this. Um, additionally, the Western sensory model, which is mostly modeled after Aristotle's five sense structure, that also needs to be reexamined because um, most people experience the world outside of five senses. I think neurobiologically they're at 30 senses now. Um, Thomas writes, in the European imagination, the Pacific exists as some far off hazy dream island with lilting rhythm, rhythms and exotic words like kava, hula, and tattoo. 
This resulted in an evocative sensual geography with the islanders as savages and varying degrees of utopia and baffled horror into their performances. Han also comments on the past sensory model construction in which anything that was seemed wild had a negative connotation, but also the people who couldn't use, you couldn't separate from the environment were also wild. Ethnographic accounts often will depict colonial erasure and complete dehumanization of the oceanic culture. Cultural assimilation and its resulting control over performances and traditions have replaced and performance as a restorative justice for individual community and environment. Ironically, the West outlawed and punished oceanic performances for centuries to only allow them back in built tourist spaces or as gimmick party themes. Oceanic performance have at times in varying degrees sustained, reclaimed, and reinvented this heritage and their continued performances despite extreme punishments in their communities are a testament to the strength and courage of who they are. So um, materiality of performance. For this project, this is the tangible adornments and objects that will accompany the intangible performance. Um, they are considered to be sort of the mnemonic holders for the intangible artifacts that are existing. Um, Graham Weir really pioneers this in the theory of Oceania. He's arguing that Oceania is actually innovative in their plant resource choices. And just because they're not following this Western scientific model of plastic, biochemicals, and metals doesn't mean that they're not innovating and um, being selective with their material use. Um, Graham also believes that the Pacific region is critical to study this area because of its biodiversity and also the ability for you to systemically link the past into the present with the sustained um, techniques in resource selection and social concepts. Um, he even says that plant materials are considered game changers, not because of form and function, but because they enable and enact sociality and these responses that they elicit. So just as we study symbols and technique patterns on an intangible artifact, we also should apply these to performances. Movements are stored, technique is learned, and in some cases, modernity is actually added and creates a whole new genre. So in oceanic communities, woven mats, sinnet fibers, and bark cloth are central in all object production. These things are woven with intangible values and social agencies. Um, when these emotional material is left from the land, it has an, an, a, an extreme impact on the oceanic community because, of, because it's out of that generational um, heirloom loop that I spoke about earlier with the cooler ring. Um, and it decreases generational wealth of knowledge. So um, I provided some examples here we have that will create the performance itself. And without these artifacts, you'll lose the effective quality of the performance. So there's jewelry, there's instruments, and there's tattoos that will pretty much consist of the adornments. And then to construct the stage, we have mats and sacred sites and using natural elements like fire and water and coconuts. And just a, a little bit on coconut trees, because I find them very interesting. It's a common material use in Oceania. It, the shell is used as a drum. The leaves are then used for weaving fibers. These fibers can be found in adornments, fishing and sailing. And so the weaving patterns actually represent and expand on these relationships and interconnectedness. Then the coconut oil is used on the performer and then also on the canoe as an expansion of the self. Um, and obviously coconuts aren't unique to Oceania, but the way that they're used and the actual societal value and the performance value of them is unique. And that is why intangible heritage is important because um, when you're finding just a coconut artifact, what does it actually mean? Um, it's also important to note that in, uh, in Oceania, almost all performance artifacts are considered objects that perform and objects that are in performance. So um, aesthetics, um, sensory archaeology is the leading theory for my project in analyzing aesthetics and performance. Through sensory archaeology, there are theoretical concepts like sense of place, seascapes, and soundscapes. I've already sort of gone into this before with the sensory order. Um, and how we need to expand on interrelationships between senses and to get away from our own bias when we engage with communities. After all, we need to make sensible reports and we can't do that without engaging all the senses. Performance identity is also crucial in establishing and sustaining maritime aesthetics and emotional heritage for this region. 
Performance, performers are in a constant state of becoming. They can embrace their warrior heritage, engage with sport. They can take on spiritual sense of place. Um, and interesting with the sports culture, I think the World um, Cup is going on for the women's. They're, they had a really amazing performance entrance. Um, the, they, researchers believe that the sports have widely replaced the warrior schools. So the warrior dances and performances are brought into the arena to support national pride, identity, and representation. I had a nice video on why I'm a rain dancer, so I'll just explain it really quickly. Um, they'll name their children after the clouds, the fog, and the rain. They see themselves as separate from the tourist Hawaii, and they joke in the video and say, look, we don't have coconut trees, and we don't look like those hotel dancers, but we are still authentically performers. Um, you'll hear phrases, often aesthetic phrases, like hula is the heartbeat of the Hawaiian people. The Maori introduced themselves first with their mountain or river. And the Aboriginal dream time, the dreaming is now and the dreaming is forever. So memory tools are found in performances and they also share in building the aesthetics and identity. These include considering themselves vessels of the past, using emotions as nodes along space and time, mnemonics, environmental anthropomorphism and rhythm. And contemporary Polynesian society, also notable performers become mnemonics in themselves because they build this type of aesthetic on who they are. And then this aesthetic is a time and space holder in the brain and the heritage, the overall heritage experience. So you can kind of think about the last queen of Hawaii. She's um, a mnemonic for the oceanic experience. Um, in her lyrics, you can see that, that she's improved, she's preserved intangible values like emotion. And this was actually legendary to believe that she wrote this when she was in captivity um, as a farewell song to Hawaii, but it's debated if that was true. But now what, what people believe it is, is it's a beacon and icon for her people. And some people will call this the queen's defiant warm embrace, a bittersweet love and farewell song. It's also in Lilo and Stitch. I think um, Elvis has redone it. So it has been passed around, but interesting, the actual emotional value of it hasn't changed. Um, so that leads me to, I'd like to play you guys a little clip. <laughs> so I want to give you an example of how, of all the, the topics we've discussed, how can we apply this to an oceanic performance? And I'm um, hopefully you can hear this. So, what image came to your mind when you were listening to this song? What emotions were you feeling? Were you in this maritime environment? Were you away with a friend? Does it remind you of something else? Laura Jane Smith stated for that for heritage to have an effect, there must be knowledge and there must be a degree of care towards what is known. Brother Iz's rendition of Somewhere Over the Rainbow is nuanced with the nostalgia for Hawaii that did not exist anymore, while also playing into the fantasy of Hawaii as somewhere over the rainbow. Hawaii is often depicted as this intangible other utopia, where time is meant to stop and the people and land can never change or are irrelevant to the overall and demanded aesthetic that you want to see of the island community. Hawaiians, however, they believe that in the intangible nature of Hawaii and, and that they believe they are integrated, inseparable from this nature. It then makes it even more powerful when Brother Is says, this is where you'll find me. So I hope that now I've added to your memories of familiar places or songs. Collectively, we have formed a new memory together, but also individually, maybe sometime in the future, you will hear this melody and think back on your time as an early career archeologist and realize the significance of feeling and emotion from a singular event. You will be able to use your emotions as nodes to track the effective moments on your cultural memories. You hopefully have now experienced a shift in your senses and will use your own wayfinding to find your way back to you in this time and in this place. <laughs> 